Well, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for uh, Sunday, March 3rd, 2013. Uh, tonight, we've got a... We're kind of at half, uh, half crew tonight. So uh, we'll see what we can get with the uh, with the people who have been able to make it tonight. So tonight, joining us, we've got this beautiful view of uh, of uh, sorry of the Rhine Nebula, and this is coming from Stuart Foreman, who's in the uh, in the San Francisco area. Hey, Stuart, can you hear us? Okay, I can. This is um, the trapezium. Sorry about my telescope slewing in the background there. Um, this is the trapezium. This is the very very center part of the Orion Nebula that normally you can't see in a telescope because. Um, uh, I mean, normally you can't see in an image because it's really dim if you take a long image. This was a five-second image that um, I took at ISO, I think, 800 or 1600, I can't remember. But I took a really short image and zoomed it in on purpose so you can see the four stars. Yeah, yeah. And so this is almost what you would see live. Like if you went down to like even like live video, you, could, you would start to see like the trapezium and, and this bright core of the, of the nebula. The nebulae. Um, all right, we're gonna, who else have we got? We've got uh, we got Bill McLaughlin, who is testing out a brand new camera. This yes. is exciting, Bill. Well, so what's well, the it's camera? it's exciting if it works. If it works. Well, is this not it working? Am I not yes, seeing it, is. it yeah, working? That's, okay. this is M, that's M44. Those are photons. Those are photons. <laughs> Those are photons working. selected specifically for my camera. <laughs> well, they've self-selected. So, oh, so what's the camera, Bill? It's a, a Santa Barbara Instruments uh, uh, STT eighty three hundred. And how good is it? Well, you know, it's better than the one I had before, which was had used the same imaging chip. It was an STL eighty three hundred, but this is kind of an upgraded version. It's got better cooling. It's got network uh, interface. Uh, it's got uh, a, a self-guiding filter wheel. It's a little more precise. So basically it's kind of a, a more sophisticated version of the one I had. Right. So it's an incremental upgrade. Whoa. Okay. All right. We've got David Dickinson who's in uh, in Florida. David, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I just had the microphone muted very briefly because the heater's running in the house here. So I didn't want the sound oh, of the heater it running. <laughs> right, and this is where right, at some point you pull out the uh, the old hair dryer and try and, try and uh, <laughs> Actually, clear up the it's, telescope. It's it's cold and dry enough here tonight. This may be one of the handful of nights in Florida that you really don't need it. Um, there's there's not a lot of doing. It's not really a problem here. It's actually pretty cold tonight. So. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. nice for Florida. I mean, don't yeah. tell us what cold is because yeah, well, <laughs> maybe about five degrees Celsius or so right now. Oh, that's We're actually reasonably yeah. chilly. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't want to yeah. be out in my shorts in that kind of weather. <laughs> yeah. Right now, um, my telescope's looking at the Earth's atmosphere because we've got clouds. So I'm tracking oh, no. Jupiter. Oh, that's why we don't see your Jupiter. Okay, well, I know that yeah. you that you had Jupiter there for a bit there. So It, it may Jupiter pop in back. and out. I'm watching, and once it comes out, I'll, I'll switch cameras over. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we've got M Mark Barrett, who uh, has uh, doesn't have a clear view of the sky tonight, but is uh, going to be showing us some some photos of a, a recent trip that he just took. So Yeah, it, it's mostly due to uh, telescope frustration, so uh, I, I'm going to spend my way out of telescope frustration this week, whether my <laughs> wife likes it or not. What's the uh, what's the what's the telescope you got your eye on next? Uh, so, so the one I've been drooling over for a while is a uh, Celestron C8, so it's an 8-inch SCT, and it comes on a, uh, a C5 uh, Germ, uh, equatorial mount, so it has the go-to and the remote control and everything, so I should be able to uh, get a lot better images for you guys in the coming weeks once I figure out how to use the thing. Well, weren't you playing with, with one, testing it uh, out? I've got a 8-inch uh, uh, C8 from built in 1974, but it doesn't right. have the go-to mount. It's got a, a cast iron wedge, and it, uh, on my trip to uh, up north to you know, middle of Wisconsin this weekend, it was very frustrating not being able to actually find anything or being yeah. able to align it properly. So I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm going to do it, whether the wife likes it or not. And uh, She's you know, glad we'll, to support we'll your goes. astronomy, and you're not helping. Um, so. act, you know, she actually loves going out to the dark si sky sites with us. Uh, she's yeah. an excellent satellite finder because she just sits in the lawn chair and just stares up at the sky, and you know, <laughs> she, she's our satellite spotter. That's awesome. Well, I can't wait to see the new scope. Uh, of course, my uh, co-host here is Scott Lewis. Hi, everyone. How's it going, Scott? And, uh, and of course, we've got Dr. Thad Zabo. Good evening. How's it going? 
Now you're you're in a little bit of pain right now, right? So we need to oh, not reco make you... recovering by now. Yeah, now you know, I'm I'm actually able to stand and move and sit for a couple, for more than an hour at a time. So oh, and you pulled your back last week, right? <laughs> We're there is no evidence for intelligent design in the way humans are put together. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> now I think it's important to get this out of the way, um, Scott. Before we uh, sort of get too busy and before we forget, uh, next week is going to be really exciting. So what's happening next week? Everything is happening next week. All the um, things. So Friday, it, well, actually Thursday for most of us, but we'll be all down at South by Southwest. So Fraser, myself, Pamela, Nicole, we'll be down at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. We'll be there with uh, NASA and the James Webb Space Telescope team doing outreach with a full-scale model of the James Webb Space Telescope. So to give context, the Hubble Space Telescope, which we all love, is about the size of a bus. The successor to it is about the size of a tennis court. So it's it's quite massive, and they're having a one-to-one -one scale of it there. We will be having our weekly space hangout on Friday. We were going to be doing a virtual star party a week from tonight. However, forecasts have changed to where we will be having thunderstorms on Sunday. Right. So we might try on Friday. Um, it's all going to depend on the infrastructure that we'll have available to us and um, that we're not dead from lightning strikes. So um, it, it's all up in the air right now. We, we want to still go through with it, but it is going to depend on a lot of other factors that are out of our control at this point. Yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, you will see us all over the place on Google+. Plus. We'll be posting pictures, I'm sure, all day long, so we're going to be having a crazy load of, of fun out there. They were estimating before the weather uh, went through. They're talking about I think what thirty three thousand people a day. We're going to be going through our tents. So, uh, yeah, you're all invited. Come you're on all down. Invited. It's free. Um, you don't need any South by Southwest badges to come to the NASA tent. We'll be there with Microsoft and North Grumman and Ball Aerospace and University of Texas. We'll yep. be all there together, working together, doing a lot of great fun with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, through the Space Telescope Science Institute out in Maryland, and you, yeah, and we will be tied to the hip to the uh, to the big model of the James Webb Space Telescope. So, if you want to find us, just look, find your way to the model and then look for us, and we'll all be there. So we'll be there with uh, Tony Darnell and Alberto Conti. And so I know yeah. um, Tony will be there with us, trying to do some hangouts or at least some video. So we'll be out there doing our thing and getting some science on. So you, anyone that's in the Austin area, please stop by, say hi, we'll have fun. So David, you got Jupiter. Yes, I did. Looks kind of like you're looking at it from the bottom of the swimming pool, but I did get it. Yeah, but you, yeah. you said that perhaps our streak of bad luck is over and that the great red spot is there somewhere. It should be on the limb on the southern equatorial belt. I, I saw it with, uh, with the eyepiece at about 200 magnification. Oh, there it goes. There you go. uh, but it's, uh, it, it looks kind of brown to salmon color. I wouldn't call it red. It yeah. looks almost like there was kind of a missing notch there, but it is, it is forward for the next. Jupiter right. rotates really quickly. So. All right. Well, we'll see if we can see it while, we, uh, while we're doing the, see the, great the black star party. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gone back behind the clouds. Yeah. All right. Well, so I've got a question here. So this is the 37 uh, cluster which yes. is one of our favorites. And I actually, this is my favorite one that I've taken in, of the last few weeks just because I can actually see the different star cloud colors in, in yeah. the cluster. This yeah, time. that's real cool. Yeah. So if anyone can't this see is, it. Yeah, this is, uh, um, I rotated and cropped it so people couldn't, can see it this time. Yeah. Oh, I see it. <laughs> 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 uh, it's a cool little asterism. Now I got a question here from Sean Kim on uh, on Google Plus. Can you answer this question? I've been observing Betelgeuse for the past two weeks and notice the star has gotten redder. It's definitely noticeable. Could there be a supernova soon, or do you guys see a difference? So Thad, is is, Betel is Betelgeuse getting redder, and is it about to blow? I haven't heard. Um, I mean, something like that would definitely be be generating buzz on the. Uh, the blogosphere or Twitter or, or G plus somewhere. I haven't seen anything that from any professional showing, uh, this is definitely something that would be reported on because I mean, if there's one star that we're all watching, there was even a meme going around every time I go out at night and I look up at Beetlejuice, I just think, when are you going to blow up? <laughs> so, um, so I haven't seen anything. Um, then again, I've also not been paying as much attention to stuff online over the last couple of days either. Um, 
Yeah, hard yeah, to say. I haven't I mean, heard. I haven't heard of anything about Beetlejuice either. changing or or being about to blow. And I guess the question is, how well can a person looking up at the sky really judge with their own eyes? I mean, you could have atmospheric effects, you could have high level cloud, you could have, you know, and just your brain could be playing tricks on you, right? Yeah, there's there's a lot of possibilities for seeing something that's potentially a different color from one night to another. Um, you know, the main thing here, this is, this is why we do photography, this is why we do spectroscopy, is so that we can record how many red, you know, photons of this particular wavelength are coming in, how many of this particular wavelength. And if you had um, objective data like that, that you could compare from night to night, that's, that's something that's worth... Um, getting somebody's attention about. But the, the problem is, yeah, the human brain is really easily tricked. So it may be just be that you're, you know, you're paying more attention to it. Maybe there's, there's been like fog or pollution or something that's been building over the last few days. Um, you know, here in, here in LA, we'll definitely get some different color stars if there's smog in the way. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I, I really haven't seen chatter about, about that happening. Now we, we do have some idea with certain supernovae, they found that there's a big puff of hydrogen that goes out a couple of weeks ahead of time for, for some supernovae. Um, but again, that's not all supernovae. So mm. there's, there's really no telltale sign. We haven't had one go nearby to us enough in the time since telescopes have been invented to, um, to really understand the full evolution of a star as it dies. I wonder so what elevation really they're looking at it at. Like how high above the horizon? Yeah, that's be. the other thing. It's closer to the horizon. It's definitely going to look redder and more twinkly too. So. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the question is, I mean, we still have not really seen that precursor. Like that star there in that galaxy is about to blow, and then a week later it blows. I mean, there's been a few precursors. They can look at them after the fact, right? When they've when the star has detonated, they can go back and look through old surveys and try and identify the star that blew up. But that's exactly it. At this point, yeah. it's not. Uh, you know, foreboding of something blowing up. It's, okay, this star blew up. Let's go look back through old photos, just like you said. And, oh, here's one from seven weeks before it blew up, and there's this extra puff of hydrogen yeah. around it. So, Possibly. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Chet1138 asks, is Stuart using a refractor? And if so, what size? And this is, um, this is the refractor. This is Stuart's view right now of the Orion Nebula. Yes, this is a, um, a 140 millimeter apochromatic F7 that I'm doing it at right now. So it's uh, with a focal length of 980, I believe, if I remember correctly. It might be a little less, but that sounds about right. I'd, just, I'd have to look it up. So which scope specifically? I'm sorry. This is the Telescope Engineering Corporation. Okay, TEC. Okay. The, the, yeah, the, the TEC. And it's, um, uh, it's one of the, uh, the Highline triplet. Uh, it's they when people talk about triplets, they'll talk about tech and they'll talk about astrophysics and and there's a couple other companies that that people will talk about. Um, and uh, uh, when I when I do my regular imaging, I will often put a focal reducer on there to reduce it to about um, 720 uh, millimeters because um, I get a little more sky. But I um, but I like to do the, the slightly zoomed in view because it often complements what Gary does, which is a very wide view and also um, uh, the other wider field scopes that we have. Um, so somebody asked, Rick Couch asks on uh, Google Plus, can you take a look at Jupiter? I think we saw the moons of Jupiter the last time we had the telescopes out during our astronomy lab. It has to confirm what we're seeing and what we're supposed to. So if you see four stars <laughs> bundled around Jupiter, you're seeing the moons of Jupiter. Yeah, they're pretty easy to pick up. Even in, uh, I've seen them even in a pair of like seven by fifty millimeter binoculars. So, yeah. there there are reports of people having seen Ganymede with the naked eye. Um, it's very tricky. You typically need like a the right placed like twig on a tree or something, and you put the twig in front of Jupiter, and if it blocks the light from it, you don't have a lot of moisture in the air, so the light from Jupiter just bleeds out around it into the atmosphere. You, it's possible to see Ganymede with the the naked eye if you know exactly yeah. how to do it. But yeah, I mean, if you have a pair of yeah, as you said, you know, seven by, you know, I, seven, by seven by thirty five binoculars, yeah. you could definitely see them. Eight by yeah. Um, so here we got a view. I get, I'm going to Bill's view here, and we got three galaxies here, Bill. That's correct. Leo's trio specifically, and uh, the one on the 
upper right, I believe, is M66, uh, upper left M65, and the one that's fainter down below, uh, NGC3628, uh, oh, fairly known, uh, fairly well known uh, Leo's trio. Um, obviously in Leo. Duh. We, we lost your view for a second there. I'm not sure if you did something. Yeah, I'm switching to a um, color view of it that I, a much longer exposure, so mm. you can see it's the same object just rotated, uh, but uh, the same uh, set of objects. Yeah, great time of year for this. So in these um, galaxies, they are uh, associated with another, one another. In fact, if you look closely at one of the arms of M66, you typically have a galaxy in a, a spiral that's in a flat plane, but one of its arms is actually kind of bent out of the plane. And what that is, is the gravity of M65 messing with it. And so the, the tidal interactions have actually taken one of the arms of M66 and bent it out of the plane. We've the, lost your image again, Bill. Have we? Yeah. Hmm. That's odd. I'm getting it. Am I, is, there, is anyone else seeing it and just no, not me? Not seeing it either. No. Okay. Well, I think Bill's just being selfish tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me try again here. Make it was sure there for a while there, and then. Yeah. So now I can see it. Go again. Okay. Yeah. Now that's the long exposure image. Uh, yeah. Uh, of the same thing I took the shorter one of. And then Very if you cool. if you look for thirty six twenty eight, I don't know if that's switched now, but. Yep. Yep. There's a closer view of 3628. It's pretty hard to yep. see. If you actually make that window smaller, it should actually make the image bigger. Okay. So you've actually we'll resized that. that image and sort of drag it in smaller. Yeah, and just keep dragging the corner in to make it. Yep. There you go. Now you want to make it a little taller, though. Yeah, perfect. Right like that. There you go. Nice. So yeah, that's 3628 long exposure. That's so this, great. Yeah, an edge-on galaxy. So Specifically again, uh, f about uh, two hours. That's a lot of data. That's very, real nice. I mean, the, that dust lane across the middle is, is incredibly sharp in this. So, you know, anytime you see this much material available for forming new stars, you, you know you have a spiral, possibly an irregular galaxy. But this is this Leo's trio or Leo triplet is uh, these three galaxies all about 35 million light years away and uh, some of them definitely interacting and it's kind of amazing seeing how much larger um, NGC 3628 is uh, compared with the the other two hmm. so. and it looks like a, a another asterism it's like a two eyes and a and a mouth <laughs> yeah it's, it's the meth the meth cluster. The meth, the meth. meth, the meth triplet yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Mark you've got uh, what are you showing us now so uh, you, the talk about what being able to see the moons of Jupiter, uh, this is a pic. This is a really blown up picture uh, that I, I showed you earlier of the uh, of Jupiter and the Pleiades. If you zoom in, yeah, this yeah. is with a fifty millimeter lens. You can see a couple of the moons right off to the side of yeah. Jupiter. So yeah. you don't really need a really big zoom lens or anything to actually be able to see see them and get any detail. But, I mean, this is a 50 millimeter lens, you know, a 10 second exposure. So, yeah. you know, everything's really blown out. Down into the right a little bit from uh, from Jupiter in this view? Um, well, the, there's... Well, I'm seeing it just to, to the left and right of it there, are the moons. Yeah, the, uh, just to the left and to the right, there there's one. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to tell what the others are, but... You know, you were saying if you want to just go see it, you know, just to see some of the moons, you don't need yeah. a lot of equipment to do so. You know, yeah. just point your SLR at it and, you know, yeah. once you have the picture, zoom in on your computer. Yeah, so, I don't know if you can see in my background, I've got my first scope there. That'll do it. So it's it's not that much telescope required. It's one of the easiest things to see. Very satisfying. Um, David Diaz asks, uh, what camera is Stuart using? Okay. Sorry. Sure, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was unmuting. I have to keep myself muted because um, otherwise you see a lot of uh, sluice, slewing and moving around. Um, I have a um, Canon T1i that is modified um, by Gary Hannes, which is um, who's a, a gentleman who will take out the regular filter of the camera and then put in a an IR blocking filter so that you can get m the more reddish stuff in uh, nebulae like um, the horse head and um, 
uh, Orion Nebula. And then I'm capturing it using a program called Backyard EOS, which is a fabulous program that will run Canon cameras that's available for pretty cheap. Yeah, I agree. That's a great program. Yeah, it's just a fabulous program. And then, um, uh, and then I'm just doing a quick um, dark reduction in Photoshop, and then moving it over and moving into the Hangout. So that's that's kind of my process what I'm doing. Um, so, and what's the object that we're looking at? Uh, this is um, M35, and um, it's a uh, globular cluster with, and it has a. Last week, somebody told us what the companion globular cluster was, and. Um, I was about to look it up when you asked me about the camera, but it's some NGC something or other. That's so completely it's completely unrelated. These are they're actually um, open clusters rather oh, than globular. Sorry, th uh, so, that's what I meant. I meant open. Did I say I globular? I just wanted to say globular. <laughs> so it's okay. open. You yeah, need to say globular at least once each each each. Exactly. Uh, BSP well, just, here, we have so. to say globular. Right? Globular. globular right. Yeah. Right. Say it properly. Yeah, open. Yeah. I'm sorry. Open cluster. Yeah. There's, I don't yeah. think there there are any globular clusters that are really visible now. But anyway, not, go ahead. not in Gemini. I mean, there's there's M79 in southern Lepus below Orion. Um, let me think of if there's any others. Yeah, it's really not. I mean, right now we're looking out outside of our galaxy. Globulars, globulars, however you want to go with it, are much more visible during when uh, Sagittarius is up. And this is essentially how uh, Howard Shapley discovered that the sun was not in the center of the galaxy. He was looking at the distribution of globular clusters and realized that they're mostly in one direction. Well, if they're spread evenly around, then if you in one direction you see most of them, that must be the direction toward the center of the galaxy. So right now where the Milky Way is through Gemini, which is the constellation that um, M35, and I think it's NGC 2135, maybe? Can't remember exactly, but it's it's a little companion up there in the upper upper right. Um, yeah, they're they're in Gemini, and right about where the sun is on uh, the summer solstice. Yeah, um, I, I don't think they're related, actually. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not one is much more distant than the yeah, other. Yeah, right. Uh, Rick uh, Rich Couch asks, do we have any connections to people in the southern hemisphere? Uh, is it possible for us to see asterisms that people in the northern hemisphere can't see during the party tonight? So, yes. not tonight. Uh, yeah, we, but we almost did one yesterday, but uh, but she was clouded out. We have uh, a friend in New Zealand, uh, two or two or three in Australia, and one in South Africa. And who's the person in South Africa? Um, that's uh, uh, Tanya. 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 Oh, yeah, is she, she going to try and join us at some point? Uh, yeah, we try. Uh, Corey and I tried to do one yesterday with her. You know, yeah. at eleven o'clock my time. You know, okay. It's around. You know, but but she was clouded out. That'd be great. I mean, she's a phenomenal astrophotographer, so that'll she's be great. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, um, send her a few emails. We'll we'll try okay. working that out yep. when uh, we're back from South by Southwest. That would be great. Uh, but yeah, so we would love to. I mean, we would absolutely love to be able to have somebody in the Southern Hemisphere, ideally somebody in South America, because because then we get the same time zone. So somebody who, although Africa would be good as well, somebody you know, if someone's Africa, then they're ahead of us in the sky, and hopefully. Their evening is well. I guess it would be late in the early in the morning for them. So I think somebody in South America, somebody in Chile or um, maybe Argentina would be a would be good because then it's not too late for them. They can show sort of at the same time of night that we are, but they're showing us stuff from the southern hemisphere, which would be amazing to see some of these constellations and objects like the Omega Cluster, things we just have never seen. The Large Magellanic Cloud would be would be stunning. So yeah, we 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 absolutely want people from the Southern Hemisphere to be able to join us and we'll, you know, if we get enough people, we'll try and do a separate Southern Hemisphere view. We've got a couple of people as as, you know, as you said, we have uh, we have Teal who's in uh, Australia, we have uh, Paul who's in New oh, Zealand. Yeah. 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 And so we've got a few other people who who have yeah. joined us in the past. Sha and we have Peter Lake. So so we've you know, and we got yeah, we got Shara and so we we're getting more and more people, but it's you know, it's funny times for them. Most of the time, for us to do the night one, it's their daytime, and so we're, that's where we get these views of the sun. So, right. the, uh, so the the southern U.S. does get Omega Centauri Fraser from uh, from Florida here. I think around April or May, we can see it about maybe yeah. 15 degrees above the horizon. But. Yeah, it would be great. Uh, we I'm would, hoping we would to love shoot to it. This, do it. Yeah, I'm hoping to shoot it this weekend. It only makes it eight degrees off the horizon here, but yeah. that's looking over the Pacific for me. So, um, yeah, nice flat and no no lights out over the Pacific from here. So that's, you know, no interference from, from light pollution. What do we got now, Bill? Uh, that is 8182 well, yet again. Wow. I, I approve of this camera. <laughs> <laughs> it is Fraser approved. It is Fraser approved. This camera is okay. 
I, you know, it's not color, but you know, it's uh, it is beautiful. You know, I'm colorblind, so I'll take it. <laughs> it's black and white. That's so good. It almost looks like color. I little did. I did a little uh, uh, old-fashioned uh, DDP processing on it, which is, uh, I think, appropriate for the start party. It, normally, you'd do that these days manually in a program. Uh, that would give you a better stretch, but that's a good quick way of doing it and making it look a little more natural. Now, is that another galaxy in the upper right-hand corner of this image? Yeah, it is, and I'd have to go and look and see what that one is. If somebody's got a star atlas, uh, it looks like an elliptical small yeah, one. Yeah, like a giant, well, it could be far away. Well, it could right? be, yeah, it could be a big one further away. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on with this object, that? So, M81, M82? Yeah, M81 is a classic uh, grand design spiral galaxy. Um, this is one of the few objects that is actually moving towards the Milky Way. If you look at distant objects, they're generally moving away, but this is close enough, only 12 million, million light years away, and the relative velocities of the Milky Way and M81, actually, actually this is one of the few galaxies that would demonstrate a bit of a blue shift. And M81 and M82 are both tw about 12 million light years away, the gravity from M81 is messing with the material in M82, and it's causing stars to form at an enormous rate. If you look at a galaxy like the Milky Way or M81, those will form about one new star, about one a year. If you're looking at the rate of star formation in M82, it's about 100 new stars each year because of the collapsing uh, gas that's, that's brought about by the tidal forces that M81 puts on M82. So it's called a starburst galaxy. Um, let's see, questions here. If you here. look at that in hydrogen alpha, you've got some really spectacular uh, 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 jets. I, I don't know if they're exactly jets, but sprays of, of hydrogen alpha, uh, I guess what you'd say to the north and south poles of it. Yeah, yeah, out of, so it's it's edge on, although we don't really know if it's quite like a, a disk or so with, with M82, but like you said, you're coming perpendicular to that, there's there's this definite outburst of, of hydrogen, again, probably because of this huge star formation rate with, with new stars comes pressure from the, the radiation from the stars, and it will likely force most of the gas and dust out of this galaxy. Uh, we just happen to catch it at the right time here where it has all this activity going on. So uh, BTL743 is wondering why someone would, somebody would choose a reflector or a refractor. Why, why would you make like, why would you choose choose which telescope? Um, there, they have different purposes. Um, the refractor is um, really good for doing uh, deep sky objects because it generally has uh, they're very generally fast and have a wide field of view. Um, and you can do planetary stuff too, but it can be there can be kind of small. Uh, ref the reflectors like the schmidt cassegrains um, uh, that Mark wants to get uh, are better for more zoomed in things like galaxies and planets. And so they, they each have their use. I just happen to only have one. Um, yeah, the, the schmidt cassegrains are great for, you know, they're, they're kind of good all around telescopes. The, you know, a pure reflector like a Dobsonian or a Newtonian are you know just big giant light buckets, but they're also very big and very difficult to move and set up and and uh, deal with. So you know I like the SCTs because it's kind of a compromise between you know portability and what you can see and what you can use it for. And the uh, you know uh, the refractors, the the bigger you get, the more expensive they get very quickly, and the heavier they get very quickly. Yeah, they they are good refractors are not cheap. I got mine used. Um, but the, every once in a while you see them used on AstroMart and um, the ni other nice thing about refractors is that you don't have to collimate them and you have to collimate uh, reflectors which means align all the mirrors up. Yeah. Well, except for my old astrophysics 6 inch uh, when I had a big wide field of view camera on it it wouldn't stay in collimations for beans. You had to change. You had to fix it all the time. <laughs> I got rid of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of the Dobsonians, if you you know, just the car ride to your observation site knocks them out of collimation. So the first thing you got to do when you get there is recollimate, which is basically just adjusting screws until uh, you know a circle looks like a circle instead of <laughs> like an egg. Now you've got a refractor as well, right, Bill? 
That's correct. Mine's yeah. a, a fairly short focal length refractor. It's a Takahashi uh, uh, 106 FSQ, which is uh, about 530 millimeters, so it's pretty short, pretty wide field. Yeah. If you're um, building a telescope, a, ref a reflector is really the only way to go, too. Oh, absolutely. Refractors are... Uh, <laughs> I've never are seen an amateur... people with the skills to do it, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> I've yeah. never seen an amateur built refractor. I'm sure they're out there, but I've never seen one. Yeah, really gr well ground uh, lenses, right? <laughs> well yeah. ground and well matched, because the the problem yeah. with the refractor is that if unless you have other lenses, if you just do a single lens, it will focus the blue part of the image at a different focal length than the red part of the image, and so additional lenses have to be put in to make it um, achromatic, meaning that all the images focus at the same uh, focal length. Well, so, well, there, there's there's achromatic and there's apochromatic actually, and the the achromatic is the apochromatic is where everything focuses down to one point. The achromatic almost focuses down to one point, and as you get to an apochromatic, that's usually a triple lens uh, in the front and that's where it gets into you know some serious money when you get get pretty big yeah so so Stuart what are you what are we looking at so I actually this is the first time I've done this see can you guess what it is Fraser <laughs> I'm gonna guess that it's the rosette it is it's the bottom half of the rosette and yeah I've never done this before and I'm really really excited about this picture. I think it looks great yeah, yeah this was, uh, um, then this gives you an idea of my field of view compared to, say, Gary's. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm only able to get the bottom half of it. Um, I think that if I had a uh, my focal reducer on, I'd be able to get all of it. But this is 120 second exposure, and I did some um, uh, stretching and some noise reduction and um, a little bit of cal color belt. So I, you know, I fussed with it a little bit to try to bring out some of the nebulosity. But um, I'm really psyched about this. Yeah, picture, actually. and you can see those dark, those dark trails, sort of in the upper left of the image there. And so, yeah. yeah. And even though Fraser hates this, I mean, it came out great. I'm really yeah, glad you bought it. Yeah. I know Fraser can't stand this. I hate this. I hate this object. No, no, I, I love the <laughs> rosette. Um, but but it's also. I mean, you've worked pretty hard to pull out this nebulosity, but you can really see that difference between your view and what you know Gary sees with his hydrogen alpha view. B big uh, difference. Right, and you can actually see the redness in this. And yeah. uh, in Gary's hydrogen alpha view, except um, on the video where I, I think that might have been a picture. I'm not sure, but the um, uh, he would just get. It would if it, he would just get um, gray, you know, at the hydrogen alpha. Yeah, he, he got red. You just can't see it because yeah. it's all he's picking up is red, and it comes across as white. Yeah, he just colors it red later on. <laughs> yeah. Now we're gonna we're gonna show uh, one of the photos that Mark took. So Mark, this was from your latest foray. Uh, yeah, I spent the weekend up at uh, my brother's cabin in a. It's, it's about an hour and a half northwest of Madison, and it's in a pretty dark area. You know, it, it wasn't, you know, I couldn't look up and just see the Milky Way, but there's tons of stars. So this was just a quick 10-second exposure uh, with a 50-millimeter uh, f1.8, you know, Canon lens. Um, you know, and you can just see so many stars just on a short 10-second exposure. It was fantastic. Yeah, that's really cool. And, you know, I've got something similar where uh, I, I took about half an hour uh, of images in the same same area, and I compiled them into star trails, which I already added to the uh, uh, to the list of pictures for the Hangout. So. Oh, okay, yeah, let's see that picture when you, uh, you yeah, want to sure. put it back up. Yeah, let me uh, switch it over to that picture. Where's my button? And there's a new cluster from Stuart. Yes, this is M37. It's another uh, open cluster, and it just it's just pretty. It's an open season on open clusters right it now. It is. I'm uh, right now. I'm trying to get um, a slightly color version of M81 and M82 too, but I'm having some framing difficulties. Oh, so. that'd be cool. Yeah. And David's got Jupiter again. David, can you try and bring out the moons? Yeah, let me change the exposure here a little bit. I might as well because the disc is so blobby tonight with yeah. the way the weather is. Let's see if I can get them. There were Jupiter's at quadrature a few days ago, I noticed, where it's 90 degrees from the sun, so the shadow is being cast off to the side. So what's interesting is two of the moons came off the limb of Jupiter, then they went back behind the shadow again. So I think two of them are still out, though. Whereas it, when it's at opposition, it's casting a shadow straight back. Oh, there, I see one. I see the moon. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, that the farthest outer planets in Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they never really show phases because of how far away they are uh, from the Sun relative to Earth. But at quadrature, where we get this right angle with Jupiter at one point, the Earth at the vertex, and the Sun at the other point, you can actually see Jupiter at like a 99% phase. It's the only time um, in in uh, its position relative to the Earth, where you it is actually slightly cut off on on one side, so a gibbous Jupiter. Oh, cool! So, not very much. I mean, you you know, without without knowing that, you'd say, yeah, it looks round. So we have a, we have a humpback Jupiter tonight. <laughs> All right. I, I always think it's weird when, like I said, when they come out, they they appear from behind Jupiter's limb, then they go back in the shadow, then they come back out again. It's kind of odd when they do that. Um, now, David, you're you, you're posting on Twitter at the same time, which is quite impressive, actually. Um, mentioning that uh, Comet 2011 L4 Pan Stars is going to be visible later this week, right? Yeah, I've been trying to watch every morning because here in Tampa, I'm at 28.5 degrees north, and somewhere in the next few days, I should be able to catch it with binoculars at least very low to the horizon down in the southwest. Yeah, it'll be very, um, very visible, very low after dusk starting Thursday. By Saturday, it will probably have gained enough altitude to be seen yeah. pretty easily. I've seen comparisons mentioned online saying that it's brighter than Difta, which is the brightest star in Cetus. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's at it's brighter than magnitude two at this point. So yeah, I've, easy, I've heard one or two right now. Yeah, easy naked eye object. If, yeah. if it's dark enough when uh, when it's still visible in the sky. So, Mark, I've gone to your your Star Trail image here. So, can you just give us an idea of how someone produces an image like this? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's really easy because you don't need any special equipment. Um, you know, you just need a, a steady tripod. You, uh, what I did with this one is I set set the camera down. I uh, figured out what exposure ended up looking good. And you can do as long as an exposure as you want um, on my my camera with a I've got a Canon T3i without a special controller uh, the most you can do on a timed uh, exposure is 30 seconds. Put magic but, lantern on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk I, you through it. It's awesome. I, I I've done it before, but it, it you know the version I tried it just didn't work out too well. So I was. You probably needed to update the firmware on your camera. Yeah. So what and and so it's requiring an update on the firmware, which is actually pretty hard to find that update on the firmware. But once you, you know, get it, I I got my my camera out of the box, and the very first thing I did was try and void the warranty on it by putting Magic Lantern on it. Yeah. Because you know, in my opinion, you don't truly own something until you void its warranty. Void the warranty, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I I've, I've been playing around with that. It's really cool. But but sorry, so so you so, yeah, the, so basically, it. I just let it go for about half an hour. Uh, this is I think about half an hour's worth of images. It's 70, 30 second images, which would be 35 minutes um, and then I use uh, there's a couple different programs one of them uh, I believe David just told me about tonight uh, it's called Star Trails or the other one that I've been using is called uh, Star Stacks and they both will uh, they'll combine the images and give you these nice little you know glowy lines uh, you know across your sky and you know Usually when you're doing something like this, you want to have a tree or something stable in the foreground to give you a sense of, of uh, you know, space and station stationary. Right, um, but the way these are working, right, is they're taking that that one image of the tree and then they're stacking up all those images of the stars. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you want, I can uh, just share the uh, the window of the program and just you, you can watch it process in the background. It's kind of neat. Sure, yeah. All right, so let me... We've lost all of our other images. I don't know. Stuart, have you updated? It's another open cluster. Uh, just now. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Here's M81 and M82. This is a six. I didn't. There's not a lot of color in here. I'm sorry, but and I didn't get to see Bill, so I don't know what his looked like. But this is um, a 60 second exposure at ISO 1600. And now, if you look at M82, the the one on the left, you can definitely see a little bit of that pink towards the middle of it, this region where hydrogen is getting kind of expelled out of the, the galaxy <laughs> by the tidal interactions. So. so Bill Napper just asked us on update on Comet Panstar. So would you say, David, in maybe two weeks we can start viewing the comet, you think? I think in southern U.S. here, I think we're going to start catching it in about a week. Yeah. It's going to be kind of interesting. I believe it's on the 15th. The crescent moon is going to be right next to it. I believe it's the 14th or 15th. Actually, the 12th, 12th or 13th. The 12th, yeah. I think it's the okay. 12th, actually, yeah. Yeah. 
So that's going to be kind of interesting to see. Nice pairing, yeah. So, um, yeah, probably if, if it's going to parallel the, the western horizon. So if you look at where sunset is, you know, later this week, Panstars will be on one side of sunset, and then as the next two weeks progress, you'll see it kind of slide north along the western horizon from night to night. So it'll, it'll be well placed in the west, and eventually its orbit's going to take it um, fairly near the north celestial pole, so it will become a circumpolar object for most of the northern hemisphere. Uh, it won't be, um, it may not be naked eye visible by that time, but it will still be a comet that would be worth shooting and, and featuring in uh, virtual star parties through, through May, most likely. At least into the beginning of May, yeah. And in April, we have another one, Comet Lemon. Comet Le uh, 2012 F5 Lemon is going to be coming by as well. And then okay. the big one. Yep. We hope. I we do. hope. Yeah. yeah there have been some great shots on... Um... Well, Panstar seems to be a pretty... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Panstars is definitely putting on a good show. There, there have been some shots from the southern hemisphere yeah. I've seen on the, the space community with both Panstars and Lemon in the same shot. And you really get a feel for how the tail forms in the opposite direction of the sun. I mean, it's very rare to see two naked eye comets in the sky at the, the same time. But you, you can see in this picture very clearly that, you know, here's the tail from, from Panstars and the tail from Comet Lemon pointing in, in the same direction, you know, the opposite direction of where the sun had just set. So, Bill, this is your uh, this is a view of your setup. That's a view of the setup. Uh, I, I had a uh, an object, but then I realized it was autofocus, so I'm uh, redoing it at the moment. So I should have an object here in another uh, minute or so. Your but mount is a lot bigger than your telescope. My, yeah, it kind of looks like a pimple, doesn't it? Well, there used to be a 14 and a half inch Ritchie on top of it, so it looked a little more normal then. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm I'm selling that and and gonna buy a smaller uh, a long focal length instrument. And then I'll put them both on the top one, this one and the other one next to it. But what what's the mount? I can't see. It's a it's a paramount. Oh oh okay. Which one? Uh, the yeah, original that, Emmy. Emmy. Yeah. It's a beefy mount though. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah no, it'll carry what 150 pounds, yeah, something like that. It's 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 not something that you can take down and lift up. Easy. Well, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not my mount. Yeah, you that you can... looks a lightweight. It doesn't look yeah. limited at all. I mean, he just on. needs a bigger wagon, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't tip as much. Yeah. Uh, well, that was cool, Mark. It was cool to see you do the Star Trails there. I was I was watching that for a while there. I'll I'll run it again through another program. It it'll you you can just watch it go. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it makes me want to go out and do some star trails. I'm gonna go and you know it, it's it's a ridiculously easy way to get into astrophotography because you don't need a special mount. You just need some patience. Yeah. Oh well, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you don't even need patience. Oh, okay. I, I, well, then, I right. set the camera up. I started it, and then I went and walked away for an hour. Okay. Well, that's perfect then. Yeah. That's 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 perfect for me. That's cool though. Look at that. It's just building up the image. Even like ISS time exposures are like that too. They're very simple to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, what else we got? I think we're all out of new images now, so we'll just watch Mark's. Uh, oh, here we go. One. I'm working. I'm working. Okay, on Bill's it. got a new one for us. I'm gonna guess that's Thor's helmet. That is Thor's helmet. I saw it up in the upper. I don't know left how he command. lost it, but he, he needs to find it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, is Mjolnir floating around in the sky anywhere, too? I mean, here's his helmet, so... <laughs> I guess nobody could have really picked that one up, either an image or, or you know, otherwise, if uh, if they did find it, so... but it's, pretty, uh, it's a very colorful object if you've got it in color. The the, the helmet part is kind of blue, and then the kind of wings are, are, are red. Okay, so kind of combination reflection nebula... Exactly, and, yeah. Um, emission yeah. nebula. Eh, maybe I'll have to try for that at the end of this week, too, so... And it's in Canis Major, I believe. Near the border with Orion. I think so, so yeah. That's, where, that's roughly where the scope is pointed anyway. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's up, right? It's, it's just in that blackness with the dots in the sky. <laughs> yeah. Probably so, within a month, Frazier, I'll start being able to get Saturn early uh, in the evening again. Of course, we're, we're going to daylight saving next week, so that's going to push us back another hour. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be great. 
Well, like, when do you see Saturn come up right now? Probably It, it comes one. up just, just before, no, it comes up just before 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time right now. Like, it's probably rising right now, but I'd have to let it clear the trees as well. So that would probably be another 10 or 15 minutes. If it were clear, I might be able to try for it, but it's cloudy. Yeah, I think we warned people that we're looking at April, May. Yeah, I, I think next, by maybe the end of March, maybe early April, like I said, with the daylight saving shift, that's going to bump all the... Saturn will start setting again at midnight next yeah. week. So. Whoa, this is cool. So we're seeing there. Bill's uh, Bill's telescope moving on that mount. God, every time my telescope mo moves, you mute me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's trying to find something that's not in the sky, though. Uh, yeah, I can't get there. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you're, you're looking at your wall there. Actually, I'm looking at my flat frame panel, so, but I'm not planning on taking a flat frame, so that, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I love when they seem to have minds of their own. It's like, okay, go to this star, and then just, what? Where are you pointing? No. Hey, come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'm, you've got one last image queued up, Stuart. Right there, yes. This is the Christmas tree cluster. Oh, nice. And, oh, beautiful. Um, I haven't seen... This is another one I've never done before. Oh, cool. And um, according to my info box, uh, this is also the Cone Nebula in the Christmas tree cluster. Um, and uh, discovered by William Herschel in 1784. And it's easy, e easily seeable in finder scopes and binocs. It's about 80 stars and also a, um, uh, I'm, I don't know what, what kind of nebulosity this is. If this is I, I think I see the Christmas tree part to it. So if you, uh, if you turn it 90 degrees counterclockwise. Uh, okay. I, need, I can see, the, I can pick out the cone. The cone is on the far right with the, it's a dark nebula imposed on the, the red emission nebula yeah, there. Yeah, right, yeah. And then, then the blue is indica indicative of dust that's scattering light. So just like our, our atmosphere scatters the blue light everywhere, so we have a blue sky. Um, that's uh, some of the blue that we're, we're seeing here. Yeah, and the Christmas tree is, you're right, it's off to, it's on the right-hand side. Here, I can zoom in on that little particular, oh, yeah, maybe I can't, there we go. Let's see, it's in here, and it's, it's, it's fuzzy. Uh, but it's on it's on its side. Oh, sorry. Anyway, yeah. it was on its side. It's 90 degrees. Yeah. So if you just yeah. flipped it 90 degrees, you could yeah. see it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we're I think we're reaching the end of tonight's virtual star party. Um, and I know that uh, David lost his weather, and <laughs> there's Mark turning. Oh, I'm trying to see what you guys now are seeing see by it. turning 90 degrees. I still don't see it. No, um, I see it. <laughs> I want more images. You can. All right. Well, I think we'll, we'll. Why don't we wrap this up then? Um, so, so again, Stuart, wonderful, uh, wonderful images tonight. Really Thanks. appreciate yeah. it. Thank it you great. so much. And Bill, congratulations on getting your new uh, on your new camera going. I approve. Oh, thank Very you, thank cool. you. Although you know, don't uh, don't put that color CCD that you do using. Well, yeah, I'll probably put it. that on there next time. I just yeah. kind of wanted to try this because it was new, and uh, I'll, yeah, I'll probably put the uh, the DSLR back on there for the next star party, assuming there's no moon. Well, I would love to see, you know, some of the images that you've taken with it, like definitely show off some of the images after you've done like three filter type views, right? Yeah, got a couple yeah, of filters great. ordered too. And David, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, yeah. sorry about your mediocre weather, Mark. That's okay. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us and revealing those images and the uh, and the Star Trail stuff. That was awesome. No problem. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, Thad, I hope your uh, your back is feeling better and take some nice pictures next week. So, and I know you're going to be gone <laughs> next week when we're going to be doing the big. Uh, Virtual Star Party from Austin. So actually, I've been watching the weather. I'm probably going to stick around <laughs> LA. Um, there's no point in driving the six hours up to Death Valley if it's going to be cruddy skies for two nights in a row. So, and actually, the forecast here looks really good. So I'm going to I'm going to try and shoot pan stars near some maybe iconic uh, Pacific Coast things in the the foreground. Mm, we'll we'll nice. see if uh, we can do that. So that would be cool. Uh, I'm well, watching every evening to recover. Happen to have here. Oh, that's good. Which one uh, is that? M95. M95, yeah. Interesting galaxy. Interesting uh, spiral arms to it. Lewis was showing us that last week. I think he was showing us the uh, supernova that was discovered in it, right? 
Yeah, that uh, showed up this past uh, 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 roughly a year ago. Is yeah, about a year ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I awesome. remember because Gary was the first one. He pulled it right up on his right as the news was coming in for it. We watched it on uh, on a hangout. That's cool. Uh, all right, and Scott, we'll see you hopefully in about five days. Yeah, I will, yeah, I will see you Four days. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. I will see you in Meet Space on I Thursday. I know, Fraser. for the first time. We've it's never met. Kind of, so kind of crazy. Yeah, that's going to be great. Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. And uh, tomorrow we're going to be doing an episode of Astronomy Cast, I think. We're going to be doing a show on earthquakes. So if you want to watch that tomorrow at noon Pacific, you can uh, join us for that. All right, we'll see you all uh, next week from Austin, live from the... Uh, <laughs> from South by Southwest. All right, take care. Good night. Bye.